is a very provocative title, uh, Viral Nanobots. You're probably expecting to see things crawling around in the room. And uh, in fact, they are crawling around the room and everywhere around you. Uh, there are only two things I want you to remember today. I want you to remember that things that you think are evil can actually be your allies if you learn to repurpose them. Uh, and also, just as uh, Oscar was just telling us uh, in his lovely talk, that it's important to try things and fail. And nothing is better at that than evolution. And that when evolution is applied against very large numbers of things, incredible solutions to problems become evident. OK, so what are nanobots? Well, nanobots are simply tiny machines. These are tiny molecular machines. Uh, so when we think about nanotechnology today, we're mostly uh, working in the realm of chemistry or in physics and building up small nano devices. I'll show you an example of, of such a device that's truly impressive. Um, but uh, when we think of machines, at least when I thought of machines as a child, uh, I always imagined them being more active than uh, some of the devices that are already being made. Um, the devices I'm going to be talking about today are from viruses and they are super old. You know, uh, humans have been innovating for a relatively short period of time on Earth, whereas the viruses have been around since before uh, the three kingdoms of life separated. They've had a lot of practice and a huge number of uh, beings that have been fighting to do this. So this is the game plan for today. We're going to tell a couple of stories. We're going to figure out what a machine is, and I'm going to introduce you to a couple and uh, talk about why viruses are evil or not, and then look at the current state of the art in engineering for nano devices for humans, and then tell you a couple of things that we've been working on uh, in my group, uh, where we take lessons from nature and from molecular evolution and then repurpose them to try to solve problems with some neat results. Okay, so what is a machine? Well, a machine uh, takes its, its name from uh, a Latin or Greek root. A machine is from a machina, which could be also called machana or machene, which is a contrivance, or mechos, which is earlier, uh, from a means or a remedy. And so a machine is simply a contrivance that provides a remedy. Okay, that sounds fair. Um, but, but it does imply a couple of questions. Uh, contrived by whom or what? And uh, a remedy to whose benefit? I think that, that we have a tendency, a conceit maybe, because humans think that nobody but humans are truly awesome. Uh, that, that maybe the, the uh, crown of our efforts is going to be coming from our big brains. But I would like to show you uh, an example of, of, uh, of a typical nano machine from nature. Uh, this is a virus. It's a type of virus that infects bacteria. We call them phage. And the phage are highly organized. They self-organize, in fact. They're not put together by little hands. Uh, they're quite small. And they self-organize. And inside this virus particle is a genome, a DNA genome. And this virus is is able to locate specifically the cells that it can grow in and deploy a, uh, a delivery device, which you see uh, being deployed right here as it's screwing down through the surface of the cell to uh, inject its DNA into the cell. And once the DNA gets into the cell it's infecting, if it is an appropriate host, the DNA can program the production of more of these little nano machines. And if it's a lytic virus, blow the cell up and that sounds truly horrible. Um, but so, so viruses are evil, right? Um, so did you realize that your genome is half made up of virus? That, that, that you would not be you if it wasn't for the viral components in your genome. The ends of your chromosomes are protected. Your chromosomes can segregate into daughter cells after copying, uh, regulation of gene expression, a lot of your immune system all viral in origin. We are heavily parasitized by these things, and we seem to be getting along with it OK. So, so maybe another one of the lessons will be that if we can learn to domesticate these viruses, we might be able to do some super cool things. Like what? OK, so are we viruses? No, we're not. But we do have a, uh, a vast microbial community that lives in us and with us. Um, I am a meat puppet that suspends at least 10 times as many microbes associated with me as there is me associated with me. You know, so who's calling the shots here, actually? And uh, if we put this on a level of scale, so I'm approximately two meters tall, so that's a person here. 
And then I'm composed of cells, and they're about a thousand times smaller, uh, the human cells. And then the bacterial cells that are associated with us are about a thousand times smaller than that. And you can think of these as being fleas, perhaps. And then the fleas on the fleas are the viruses that infect the bacteria. And they are truly at the nanoscale. They're down at the level of, uh, if you take a one and you put nine zeros after it, uh, that, that's the scale we're talking about, that one over um, 10 to the nine. So um, this is an example of bacteria associated with a human cell, and different bacteria can associate. And some of them are good and bad. And uh, how can we employ these viral uh, entities in order to help us right out of the chute? Well, I had a, a physician working in my lab for the last couple years, and uh, she was a pediatric infectious disease expert, and she came to me and my colleague and said, there are these babies, and through no fault of their own, they were born with terrible immune systems, and so we have to plant catheters in them and pump them full of medicines to keep them alive, and it's, it's truly sad. But the problem is that we are colonized by bacteria. These bacteria are important. They keep us healthy, in fact. They protect us from, from some of the bad bacteria. But what happens is these bacteria can get into the catheters and plug them up, and then you can't deliver the medicines to the babies. And because they're little, you can't just keep putting catheters in their body. So she asked, you know, is it possible to kill off the bacteria with bacteriophage? And I said, sure. Um, that was some of the earliest forms of antibiotics. They called it phage therapy. And then when the antibiotics came on, uh, we switched over to that. Well, it turns out that a lot of the bacteria that you find associated with people uh, in hospitals now are resistant to these antibiotics, so we need something different. And so sure enough, she found that she could uh, take these catheters and put bacteria all over them, spray them with a virus, and then the bacteria would go away. And it was every bit as effective as the antibiotics, and you know, I think that going forward with that to develop it for clinical practice sounds like it might be a good idea. Okay, so. The next part I want to talk about is building things from this. So I just mentioned a way of using viruses to solve a problem. It's the virus itself that's doing it. Is there something that we can use about viral mechanisms that also can serve to solve our problems? Now, we typically think of these as engineering solutions. And uh, humans, again, think very highly of themselves. We're the crown of creation, naturally. And so uh, surely uh, we, a little virus that has no brain and no eyes can't possibly solve problems better than what we can come up with. And so I'm going to give you an example from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. This is a device that's truly impressive. It was composed out of uh, using electron lithography, putting down individual atoms, built up this object called a nanobolometer. And what a nanobolometer is, is a really fancy thermometer. And it can measure single photons encountering it and generate a little bit of a change in temperature, which it can measure uh, with an electrical current. And uh, this is a, going to allow us to build super sensitive telescopes that can see the radiation that makes up about 93% of the universe. And it, so this is actually a truly remarkable feat. However, on, when you think about it, it, it's a wire, okay? So, so that's, a, that's kind of the level where we're at with a lot of our nanotechnology right now. We can make cages, we can make little balls, we can make nanotubes, and we can make wires. Okay. Now, in contrast, this is what nature can do. So this is an example of one of these nano machines. These pictures are taken from X-ray crystallographic images, atomic level detail, of the proteins involved in DNA synthesis, and, and also some additional uh, information from biochemistry and genetic studies. And what this machine is doing is unwinding the DNA double helix, and then from each of the two strands, copying another double helix off it, one continuously that way, and the other one so-called discontinuously in the other way, in this remarkably coordinated, highly efficient, and high fidelity process, a process that is essential for us to survive. And there is no invisible hand pushing this. This is occurring simply under the volition of physics. And these, these, these machines self-assemble, they find where they need to go, and they do their job without us telling them what to do. Now that sounds like a generally good thing to try. So uh, we've been working with a nano machine uh, that, that we call a Synexo, and, and a Synexo is, is a very simple machine. It's made up of two parts. One part takes DNA double helices 
and grabs onto an end and chews off one of the two strands. That doesn't sound too safe. But it turns out that this processing of the DNA then allows another protein to bind, and that can be used to find other DNA molecules and join them together in a process called genetic recombination. Now, the biotechnology revolution, which was the product of human brains and hands largely, uh, involved intentionally putting pieces of DNA together in the test tube and making new DNA sequences out of it, which is also truly impressive. But in nature, naturally in our body, this occurs quite frequently and, uh, and with astonishing uh, uh, fidelity as well, as well as efficiency. So it would be nice if we could do this on purpose when and where we want to. And so we've been studying this for a number of years. So we use this particular nanobot to do genetic engineering, not just genetic engineering, but genomic engineering inside cells. And I'll give you some examples of that. So this is what that machine looks like in part. It actually is made up of component parts we have some structural information for. And the reason why we get structures is because when you can see what something looks like, you have a good idea about how it can work. Seeing how something looks can tell you how it works, and that can help you imagine how to make it different. Okay, so this is what this nanobot looks like. It's made up of a donut, and that donut digests the DNA, which is shown here in this model that one of my students made. You can see the DNA double helix being resected, and associated with it is a DNA binding protein that forms a complex with it, and as the single-strand DNA is produced, it binds to it, and this is the CPU of recombination. Because when this binding protein binds the single-strand DNA, it now has the capacity to find where the homology is, where the similar sequences are, and direct whatever sequence you want to that site. Why would you do that? Well, you can do that to intentionally find specific sites in a genome and change the sequences so that you can make a change, like in gene therapy or to produce something novel that helps you understand how cells work. So this is an example of how we do that. We can use these nanomachines to take small synthetic DNAs. These are very easy to make now. You can go to your computer, type a sequence into the computer, send 10 bucks to New Jersey, though not this week, and then they will send you back a small piece of DNA that you can then introduce into the cells along with these nanobots, and they will direct the DNA to bind in, in a replicating genome, and that will become part of the genome and change it. And this can be astonishingly, uh, uh, have very astonishingly high rates of synthesis. This is an example of the sorts of things you can do with it. This was done with, uh, by some colleagues of ours in Germany. If you don't know what a gene does, you can often figure it out by, by looking at what its protein uh, is doing in the cell or where it goes. And so in this particular case, they uh, fused genes of unknown function to a protein that they can see uh, with this blue stain. And so just as an example in the bottom, this protein here is expressed in all of the cells in a mouse's brain, whereas this one is only in the cerebellum. So without even knowing what that protein does, by knowing that it goes specifically, say, to the cerebellum, that can uh, provide very useful information for understanding how the brain works, but also ultimately, perhaps, how to fix it when it is defective. Uh, as I mentioned, this can be an extremely efficient process, and in, in our lab and in others, we can get recombination rates at very high rates, almost 100 percent, 50 to 100 percent of the time when you put DNA in a cell, you can make a change in the genome, a change of anything you want. Okay, so how do we follow that? Well, we like to work with fluorescent molecules because they're beautiful. And, and it's, it's good to have pretty things in your life. But also, it allows us to quantify how well this works in the cells that we work with. And uh, a student in my laboratory has been modifying this protein from the jellyfish, the green fluorescent protein, uh, so that you can make a number of different colors out of it simply by changing the sequence inside the cells. And uh, the reason why we use these fluorescent reporters is they're very sensitive and quantitative. And for a biochemist such as myself, being able to measure the numbers and critically evaluate whether something is working or not, as Oscar was telling about earlier, you, you have to be very clear about how well something is working and report it faithfully in order to decide whether to go forward with it because it's expensive. And what we see is that by using these nanobots, you can stimulate the rate of recombination in some cells up to 100,000 fold. Okay, 
we can get this up to points where it is therapeutic, perhaps. So this is an example of a recent experiment where the recombination efficiency is now approaching 10%. That is 10% of the cells that were being, uh, having the DNA introduced into them, uh, now take on the change of the specific type that was being evaluated. Again, in this case, it was a change in the fluorescence gene. And here's some examples of cells that have had DNA that have been modified using recombinating and placed into them. These are stem cells. These are some of the cells we're working with. So the ultimate goal here then is to, to modify genes in genomes, perhaps genes in stem cells, perhaps derived from your own body, and grow these up in culture and then place them back in your body to do the job that stem cells do, which is to repair your tissues. So if you have a genetic defect that's causing you a tissue problem, this is a way to change the, the tissue in your own body using these viral nanobots. So here's an example of a type of application. This poor child here has a disease that is going to make her die of old age before she's 13. Mm. It's called progeria. Maybe some of you have heard of it. And uh, these children typically die from vascular problems, from ischemia, uh, heart attacks, such like. Otherwise, they're pretty normal. Uh, the problem she has is a stem cell problem that results from a single mutation, a single nucleotide mutation, the type that we can repair with very high efficiency using these viral <coughs> nanobots. And when this mutation appears, the nucleus takes on a shape rather like a raisin, and this screws up everything genetic, how genes are expressed, how they're repaired, how they're copied, how they're segregated, and the cells that are so affected, the stem cells, die off and then she dies of old age for the same reasons we die of old age, that the stem cells are dying off. We can use fluorescence to follow the rate of this reaction. Here's an example of a type of substrate where by monitoring a change in color, perhaps we can use that to follow the recombination of the site, ultimately to correct that mutation and, uh, and follow it by a change in phenotype. So this is an example of how we can employ these viral nanobots specifically to correct a genetic defect in this case associated with a terrible disease, but there are many other applications like this as well. So I want to leave you with a couple thoughts. These viral nanobots exist to serve the needs of the virus. The virus isn't doing this for us. The reason why the viruses use this particular nanobot specifically is for packaging its DNA so it can replicate. Okay, so this is what a viral genome looks like. This is BYTP, BYOTP. So each of these sheets of toilet paper represents a single viral genome. And in order for the virus to package its genome, it needs to stitch several together in a line so that it can bite onto the piece of DNA and then stuff it into the head of the virus. And then it bites the gum and packages the DNA inside its head. And that's what allows it to grow and form the next thing. So, so this, this machine is there to cause the genome to get bigger, not to repair genetic defects. So the idea then is that by looking into nature and the solutions that nature has for its problems, in this case viral problems, we might see unique solutions for human problems as well. And I'll leave you with that thought.